passionate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good evening for attendees who joined us from the Middle East and Europe, and good afternoon for attendees who joined us from USA and Canada. My name is Dr. Tarek Azuddin, a research institutional official, consultant, and medical program director, and I'm pleased to be your host today. Uh, just a little reminder for whom joined us today for the first time. After the overwhelming attendance and the standing ovation we received for the previous symposium webinar titled How to Present a Successful Proposal and IRB, we were encouraged to carry on with other exciting topics for research and researchers. Uh, these webinars are the fruits of a dedicated teamwork and efforts from the MAM Medical Complex uh, targeting research and researchers under the care and patronage of the CEO of the MAM Medical Complex, Dr. Zakaria Safran, and organized by the Training and Academic Affairs under the leadership of Dr. Malik El Moteri, while the logistics are professionally executed by the Vent Troop Organization team. I wish now to give you all a little introduction about the webinar series. Today, we are pleased to start the third webinar of a series of seven webinars accommodating all the modules of the Good Clinical Practice, abbreviated for GCP. Uh, as we explained before, attending all the seven webinars and successfully completing the quiz at the end of the seventh and last webinar will qualify you to receive the certificate of completion of Good Clinical Practice, including seven hours internationally verifiable CME or CPD. I wish to inform the audience that everyone can feel free to post this question using Twitter, hashtag research underscore Saudi Vision 2030, and we will take them in order after the lecture to the presenter. And if there will be an excess of questions than the time frame permits, the presenter will kindly answer them later in Twitter. Regarding the audio icon, it is located down to your left uh, of the screen where you can easily unmute it. Uh, as we explained before, this GCP course is an essential international ethical and scientific quality standard for clinical trials. It also serves to protect rights, integrity, and confidentiality of any trial subject. Today, our third webinar will be titled The Informed Consent. To present this exciting and essential topic, we are again pleased to invite Mr. Naim Nuruddin, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Sierra Limited UK. Mr. Naim is a graduate in pharmacology with toxicology from King's uh, College University London, where he started his career as a clinical pharmacokineticist. During his 20-year career, Mr. Naim has held various positions of increasing seniority and is actually the CEO of Sierra Limited UK, which he founded in 2007. His company, highly specialized and focused organization, offering training, development, and consultancy in all aspects of International Council for Harmonization and Good Clinical Practice and related guidelines, as well as for personal effectiveness and behavioral skills. Mr. Naim brings with him over 20 years of experience in clinical development, training, consultancy, and education, spanning Europe, United States, States, Middle East, and Asia. Mr. Naim is also a lecturer in Cranfield University, UK, and the certified facilitator and behavioral skills trainer. Mr. Naim has worked extensively in the Middle East and Asia, developing and building clinical research capability with the regions. While in Saudi Arabia, Mr. Naim was intimately involved and chosen to establish the structure of the Ministry of Health Ethics Committees and was heavily involved in developing the standard operating procedures and deploying the training for the Ethics Committee members nationally. Please welcome Mr. Naim Nuriti. Thank you very much and uh, thank you very much Dr. Tarek and again it's a real pleasure to join you this evening and be part of your evening and what I'll do is I'll go straight into the presentation and I'm going to spend a little of time here now talking about a very very important aspect of clinical research and that is informed consent so i shall share my slides with you now my screen in fact and, uh, there it is okay so informed consent is what we're going to talk about today and a very complex very interesting topic and what are we going to do I have some objectives for this webinar for this our next hour. So what I'll do is I'll really explain to you what is the purpose of informed consent. We will look at how to obtain informed consent and something we call assent in accordance with ICH GCP. And then finally, I'm going to introduce two new people to you who are involved in the consent process. And one of them is called an impartial witness and the other is called a legally acceptable representative. 
So what we really focus on is how do we take consent from clinical trial subjects or subjects who are going to be involved in the clinical trial project. So before I do that, I should do a little bit of a recap from yesterday and the day before yesterday. So if we go back to the principles of GCP, which was in section two of the GCP guidelines, you remember section 2.9 stated of the principles of GCP that freely given informed consent should be obtained from every subject prior to clinical trials participation. So that is the principle of GCP we must have informed consent. Having said that, I see GCP guidelines. Remember, we're in a number of sections. Section two was principles. Section three of the GCP guidelines talked about the role of the IRB and IEC. And section four of the GCP guidelines talks about the investigator responsibilities. So as researchers, your responsibilities are in section four of the GCP guidelines, and in particularly, Section 4.8 talks about the informed consent of trial subjects. So everything I'm going to tell you today is actually from Section 4.8 of the GCP guidelines on how to take informed consent. Plus, I'll give you a little bit more information as well. So the first question is, what is informed consent? And this is the GCP definition of informed consent. Informed consent is a process. Now that's a very important word to remember. It's a process. It's a process by which a subject voluntarily confirms his or her willingness to participate in a clinical trial after having been informed of all aspects of the trial that are relevant to the subject's decision to participate. Very important points over here, a process and voluntary and very importantly, information that's gonna be relevant to help them make a decision. The informed consent is documented by means of a written, signed, dated informed consent form. So for all clinical trial subjects in clinical research, they must have a signed and dated informed consent form. We need to see that document before the subjects can participate in any clinical trial. So something very important to remember here and a little bit of recap. ICH says in obtaining and documenting informed consent, the investigator should comply with applicable regulatory requirements. So what we need to do is look at our regulations. What do they say with GCP? That is follow section 4.8 of the GCP guidelines, which I'm talking about. And also they must adhere or follow the ethical principles that have their origins in the Declaration of Helsinki. If you remember, this was our foundational document on clinical research ethics. Yeah? So follow local, regular, follow local regulations, follow GCP, and follow the principles of the Declaration of Helsinki. If you do that, we have met consent according to international regulations. Something from yesterday, you a little recap for you. So prior to beginning of the trial, the investigator should have the IRB IEC's written approval or favorable opinion of the written informed consent form. So this informed consent form, which has to be a written document, must be approved by the ethics committees before it can be discussed with any clinical trial subject. This is one of the documents you will send to your IRB when you are submitting your research pro pro proposal, the clinical trial. One of the key documents is the informed consent form. They will want to look at that. They will make sure that this document is in line with good clinical practice. So I said, well, we need a document. We need an informed consent form. What do we put inside this informed consent form? What type of detail should be in this informed consent form? Well, the answer is ICH section 4.8.10 tells us exactly what to include in the informed consent form. 
of the informed consent form are actually outlined in ICH. And these are the, there are approximately 20 elements. And I'm going to take you through these elements, which should all be outlined in the informed consent form. And this is what they are. First of all, there should be a statement in the consent form that says that this is a research study. So this is a clinical research study. There should be a statement of the purpose of the trial. Why are we doing this? So the purpose of the research is to whatever it may be. So that has to be in there. Also, what is the treatment? And if it's a randomized study, what is the probability of randomization? So for example, if it's treatment A and treatment B, what is the probability I will get treatment A or treatment B that has to be described in there? All the procedures that the subjects have to undertake should be described as well. And this will be about invasive procedures as well. Also, what are the subjects' responsibilities? You know, what do they have to do? Well, subjects, you have to follow the protocol. If I'm giving you examples here, you have to follow the schedule of the protocol. You have to inform the investigator if you're not feeling well. And you also have to employ adequate contraception if that's important. So that there'll be a description of that. You will also have to describe the experimental aspects. If there are any experimental aspects of this uh, protocol, of this research, describe them. Then very importantly, what are the risks or the inconveniences of this? So this is where you'll say, these are the potential benefits we think, and these are the risks. So for example, if it's a drug trial, what is the side effects of the drugs? Those are the risks. What are the benefits? Well, let's say, for example, we're doing an asthma study. Well, the benefit of this drug is it may improve your symptoms. We are testing this. We look at, you have to mention, what are your alternatives? What if you don't want to be in this research? Very, very important. If you don't want to be in this research, that is fine. The doctor, your doctor will discuss alternatives with you. We have to mention that. We also, also have to mention what are the compensation for this research. What if something happens to you? What if something goes wrong? What is the compensation going to be for you? So that has to be stated as well. Remember yesterday I said the IRBs are going to look at the payments being made to the subjects. If there is a payment, how much payment will be made? That has to be documented in the consent form. Also, what if they're going to incur any expenses, what these expenses would actually be? Okay. So that sounds something else we need to include in there. We would also need to include a statement that this is purely voluntarily. You, this is a voluntary decision. You are free to withdraw at any time of, you like. Okay. So that has been clearly made over there. Something else we have to talk about now, and this is the confidentiality, is when we do research, people will look at your medical records. So who has access to your medical records? has to be clearly stated in the consent form. So for example, you may have to say that the sponsor of the study will send monitors who will look at your medical records. The IRBs may want to look at your medical records. The study team will look at your medical records, making it very clear who has direct access to this. And then you have to make a statement about the confidentiality, that your data, your medical records, your information everything will remain confidential. Usually you will only be known as a number outside of this clinical trial. Also what can happen is you, what you must put in the, in the consent form is that if new information becomes available about the study, about the drug or whatever, we will let you know as soon as possible or in a timely manner. And I will come back to that point very shortly. Also that in the consent form, you have to put on the people to contact for any information. So here you would give the investigators details maybe. You know, if you have any questions and a problem, these are the people you can contact. Then finally, you also put the reasons for termination. Yes, we know this research is ongoing, but we may stop the research and the reasons why. So for example, some of the reasons could be that the drug was too toxic, for example, so we're stopping the research. There can be many reasons. So if you fail to follow the study procedures, we may terminate you. So we are very, very transparent in our consent form as to what we will say. Then also we'll include a statement of the duration of your participation. 
So if this is a two-year oncology, three-year oncology study, you would say that your participation will be for approximately three years. If it's a short uh, seasonal influenza study, maybe four weeks, three weeks, whatever, making it very, very clear how long they've been involved. And then finally, we put the number of subjects in the research. So if it's a big international study, we will say approximately 500 or 5,000 subjects are going to be part of this research. So this is the minimum context requirements of a consent form for any clinical tree. So as you can probably see, there's quite a bit of information and this has to be captured in the consent form. Now, this is the minimum information. We then have to see, are there any specific institutional requirements that they want on the consent form? Because if they are, we need to include those. And then we also need to know, are there any regulatory requirements of the consent of consenting procedures? They need to be included in there as well. So this is what is minimum components of a consent form. And this is when this is written and you send it to the IRB. They will review this. They will check this. Have you addressed each one of these points? Because they have the GCP guidelines as well. And if you don't, if it's not addressed correctly, they will not give you approval for the consent form. So this is a little quick introduction into the standard consent form we have for our clinical trials. So we have this consent form, we've written this consent form. How do we present this information to our subjects? Okay. But very importantly, the consent form must be written in a non-technical style and a language understandable to a layperson. This means it has to be written so that a non-scientist can understand this. So for example, if we say 10 milliliters of blood will be taken, how much is 10 milliliters? The lay person may not know that. So for example, you may say two teaspoons of blood will be taken from you is a phlebotomist we don't know layman's term the blood will be taken by a nurse on writing a consent form so just to give you an example a consent for an adult's consent form should be written in a language that approximately a 13 year old should be able to understand that's the level of non-technical style we want to see in a consent form and this is what the lay person on an irb will be looking at because they don't understand science but they should be able to understand exactly what the consent form is saying. Okay. Very importantly, the consent form must not contain words that cause the subject to waive or appear to waive the legal rights or release or appear to release the investigator or institution from any negligence. So there shouldn't be any little clauses anywhere like we see on contracts. Yeah, it's not a problem if something goes wrong, nothing like that. Have that. Okay. So that's again some some minor minor things. Can everybody hear me properly? Can yeah. you can you switch off your camera? Maybe it will affect your sound, please. Okay, I can do that. Let me just try that. Okay. Let me have a look. Can you is this any better? It is better. Go ahead. Okay, all right, okay. So now what we'll, I'll talk about, I'll go take you through is the informed consent process. So we have an informed consent form. We've seen the type of language this should be written in. Now, what is the process? It, and this is what we'll talk about now. So the informed consent process. Well, what is the purpose of this process? Well, the fundamental purpose is to give the subject adequate information to make an informed decision. Informed means we've informed them, they've understood. And I want us to remember this in a, in a little while. Okay? So give them the information to make an informed decision. We present the language, the, the study in a language that is clear and understandable. So the person who is obtaining consent must use very non-technical language, be very clear. If there are any questions the subject has, you must answer all of those questions. 
and very importantly, explain the study, spend time with them in an appropriate setting. That is having enough time for good conducive decision making. So not in a busy ward, take them to a separate room, sit in there, give them one-to-one -one attention and talk to them and explain the study, explain the research to them. And once you do that, give them ample time and opportunity to inquire about the trial and decide whether or not they wish to participate. For example, if they say, you know what, I want to go home and think about this, let them go home, think about it. Let them discuss this with family members if they want to. And then when they've decided, come back and give you their decision. So what we're trying to do with this whole kind of process is enhance the subject's comprehension of the information that is being given to them. We make sure they understand that this is voluntary. They can refuse to participate if they want to, or they can withdraw from the study at any time without penalty. And this would have been mentioned in the consent form anyway. So let's say, so we have the process, we have the informed consent form. The subjects come in, we sit with them, we discuss this, product, this research with them, we give them the informed consent form, we take them through the informed consent form. The subject says, I need to go home, I need to think about this, let them go home, let them think about this. Then they decide, they come back and they say, you know what, I am, I am quite comfortable with this and I wish to participate in the research. And if they wish to wish to do that, then this is where the documentation comes in. So the subject has to personally sign and date the consent form. And the person who is obtaining consent must sign and date the consent form too. Once that is done, the subject can then enter the clinical trial. We have a copy of the consent form and we give the subject a copy of the informed consent form. And in that way, the consent process is complete and the subject can enter the clinical trial. So, sounds good so far, I hope. So what, what, what happens now? So when I've just discussed this little process to you, we, discuss, we sit with the subjects, we discuss this with the subjects. It's an informed decision. So as researchers, we have to make sure that they actually understood what we were telling them. So one important aspect of the part of the consent process is assessing the subject's comprehension. Did you understand what I actually said? So this is something as good researchers, we should make every effort to do. So let's say, you know, we do the consenting process, the subject comes back and the subject says, I have no questions. Does this mean they actually understood the process? They understood the research. So what we do is we can ask them questions. Ask them questions, this furthers a discussion. Asking them questions maybe help them ask questions to you as well. It gets the subjects to think more carefully about the study and then really helps you as a person obtaining consent to actually decide, did they adequately understand the study? Remember consent is the fundamental aspect of research and it has to be an informed decision. So we will take every step as researchers, as investigators, to make sure the process is followed and we are happy that the subjects have understood the, uh, the research. So the type of questions we, are, we can ask them, and these are just examples for you to give you an idea what you can do when you're doing the consent process. Don't ask them closed-ended questions, which are yes or no. For example, did you understand the study? And they say, yes. Well, did they or didn't they? We don't know. So what you do is you ask them open-ended questions. So questions where the answer is not going to be a yes or a no. So for example, these are just a few examples for you, you know, just so that I'm sure you understand what is expected of you. Could you please explain to me what you think we're asking you to do? Can you describe in your own words the purpose of the study? What are the risks? What are the benefits, do you think? Can you tell me what the alternatives are? So this is a real attempt at assessing the comprehension of the subjects. And this whole kind of process really makes a very strong, a very robust, important consent process. Okay? 
So one thing I mentioned is, you know, we do informed consent, we follow this process I mentioned, the subject enter, enters the clinical trial, the clinical research. Now, as research is progressing, pro progressing, clinical trial is progressing, sometimes new information will come along. And if any new information comes along that's going to impact the subject's decision to participate in the research, we must inform them and get their consent to continue. So ICH states that the written consent form and any other written information to be provided to subjects should be revised whenever important new information becomes available that may be relevant to the subject's consent. Okay? So this makes it very, very clear. However, if you're going to revise the informed consent, remember I mentioned the, we can only use informed consents that have been approved by the IRB. You must revise the informed consent. You must submit it to the IRB, get the approval, and then use the consent form. What then happens is once we have this new information, we let the subject know in a timely manner and get them reconsenting and make sure they're happy to participate or continue in the research. And all of this must be documented. This process must be documented within the medical records. So when consent is being taken for a subject to be part of a research, in your medical records, you have to document clearly how consent was taken. So consent, for example, who did the informed consent? What date was it done on? What questions were asked by the subject? It was signed and dated, and you gave them the consent form. This should be a nice paragraph within the medical record that clearly shows and gives us the evidence that yes, we followed informed consent as per ICH GCP. Okay. So, so that was a very kind of quick overview of what's inside the consent form and the consent process. What I have described to you just now is the consent process in a subject who is literate. That is a healthy subject who has the mental capacity to make a good decision. They can read and they can write. So very straightforward process. However, things are not that easy. When we do research or clinical trials in vulnerable populations, we will have individuals who may not have the mental capability to provide informed consent. So what we do is we have to have special provisions Put in place for them and this is what i'm going to explain to you now what i'm going to talk about now are what we call vulnerable populations so what are vulnerable populations so here's a little um, information on what a vulnerable population is so it can be any individual that due to conditions either acute or chronic who has his or her ability to make fully informed decision for him or herself diminished can be considered vulnerable. So somebody whose decision-making process has been diminished. Okay. So any population that due to circumstances may be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence to participate in a research is also considered vulnerable. So who based on this decision could be vulnerable? And here are a few examples. So minors, for example, children, when you do pediatric trials, they're not adults. They cannot make decisions for themselves. How about illiterate subjects? Subjects who cannot read or write. I just explained a process to you where subjects could read and write, read the consent form. What if, if I have a subject who cannot actually read and we have to take them through the consent form? How do we do it? What about mentally incapacitated subjects? So let's say, for example, we're doing research in individuals with dementia or maybe individuals with um, um, schizophrenia, for example. Or what if we're doing research on unconscious patients? How do we take consent from them? And this is what I'm going to explain to you. And if I just go back to the second bullet, any population due to circumstance may be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence. So coercion, so what about the poor, poor countries where you've got very poor people there? A clinical trial turns up, it's a good opportunity to get treatment. They can be coerced. So there should be special 
processes put in processes put in place to protect the rights of these subjects and that ties in with good clinical practice and i shall now explain this to you and take you through this so let's start off with what if subjects were illiterate that is they cannot read or write no so let's say for example i have an adult subject and now let's say i'm living in in saudi arabia and let's say for example i can speak arabic but i cannot read and write so i'm a professional i can make my own decisions but i cannot read or write arabic but i can understand arabic but i just said the process is the person obtaining consent gives the consent form to the subjects to that to the subject and takes them through it now if the consent form is in arabic obviously i cannot read it and i cannot write arabic how will you take informed consent from me so this is what we will do if we have illiterate subjects subjects who cannot read and write so if we're going to do research in subjects who cannot read and write then what we have to do is we have to bring somebody else into the consent process remember consent is a process so somebody else has to come into the consent process and this somebody else is someone we call an impartial witness so an impartial witness so what happens is if you are going to take consent from somebody who cannot read or write we need a third person there and this third person is an impartial witness according to gcp who can be an impartial witness this is the definition it says it's a per a person who is independent of the trial who cannot be unfairly influenced by people involved with the trial who attends the consent process if the subject or the subject's legally acceptable representative and i'm going to come to that person in the next session in the next few minutes cannot read and who reads the informed consent form and any other written information supplied to the subject so what does this actually mean so this means i need to get somebody else who is not related to the clinical trial not related to the site but this person who's with the impartial witness must be able to read and write so what happens is as a subject i need to bring somebody with me so it could be for example my brother my my whoever my 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 partner my mother my father anyone who can read or write they have to come with me and this person has to sit through the entire informed consent process so how it would work is let's say i am an investigator i am taking informed consent from an illiterate subject the consent form i have to take them through but they cannot read it so what will happen is i give this informed consent form to the impartial witness who the subject has brought with him so this impartial witness will look at the consent form i as an investigator will have a discussion with the subject and i will take them i will discuss the consent form the impartial witness is listening am i saying what is written on the consent form yeah. my discussion is going to be with the patient yeah i'll be discussing with the subject the subject says yes i need to think about this i want to go home we let them go home and when they come back they must bring the same impartial witness with them i again i will have a discussion with the subject and and if the subject says yes i wish to continue in the research or want to be part of the research then remember ich says consent must be a documented process this consent form has to be signed so who will sign this consent form what it will be me the investigator or the person obtaining consent will sign and take the consent form then the impartial witness will sign and date the consent form and then if possible the subject will sign and date it if they cannot sign and date it they will give their thumbprint that is how consent is going to be done with an illiterate subject the impartial witness will sign the consent form and the impartial witness signature actually means that the investigator or the person obtaining consent actually took said what was in the consent form and the patient is giving freely informed consent that's what it means so the consent is 
still coming from the subject. It's not coming from, from the impartial witness. The impartial witness should sign the consent form and pre be present through the entire consent process. And as I mentioned, the impartial witness will personally sign and date the consent form. And the subject, if capable, will sign and date. If they can't, they will put their thumbprint on, thumbprint on there. And this is how we will have to handle this. And this process, or whenever you do this, you will document in each subject's medical records who the impartial witness was and how the process was conducted. So there you go. So that was an impartial or illiterate subject. We will now talk about what, how do you take consent from minors or children? We do a lot of pediatric clinical trials now because the regulations in the world say pediatric, you know, if you are going to do a, for, if you're going to have a medicine in the pediatric population, then you must have shown the evidence in the pediatric population. So how do we take consent from children? And how do we take consent from subjects who are mentally incapable of providing consent? So let's say, for example, patients with Alzheimer's disease who don't understand what the research is. How will we do this? And now I'm going to explain this to you. Well, what happens is whenever we're going to do consent in a child, minor or mentally incapable person, we need to bring another person in. And this other person we call a legally acceptable representative. So now, for example, if it's a child pediatric study, we need their legally acceptable representative. Usually in children, the legally acceptable representative is the parent. ICH gives us a definition of a legally acceptable representative, and I'm displaying it here. So this is what it is. An individual or juridical or other body authorized under applicable law to consent on behalf of a prospective subject to the subject's participation in a clinical trial. So what happens over here now is when, let's say for example, if it's a pediatric clinical trial, I will need to take consent from the subject's legally acceptable representative. So I need the guardian, the parent, and they will give me consent. What if it's a mentally incapacitated adult? So who is their legally acceptable representative? If it's a husband, is it the wife? Then we'll take it from the wife. If the person is a widow, is it their son or their daughter? We will take consent from them. So in this case, we'll have a consent form where the legally acceptable representative will sign the consent form. The person obtaining consent will sign the consent form as well. And if possible, the subject will do it. But it's a little bit more complicated than that now. Remember, if we talked about, I talked yesterday, I talked about the fundamental ethical principles, and that was the autonomy, autonomy of an individual. We must respect that individual's autonomy. So even if a subject who is incapable of giving consent, we must respect their wishes. Okay? So what happens and what we say is, <clears throat> for a minor, for example, we need the consent of the legally acceptable representative. However, when we look at our GCB guidelines and the declaration of Helsinki, it talks about something else and it says assent. What it says now is even though you'll have subjects, individuals incapable of giving consent, we must obtain assent from the subject. So assent actually is that subject who is not capable of giving fully informed consent agreeing to participate in the research. So assent has to be obtained to the extent of that person's capacity. This is what is very, very important. What really has to happen is after being provided with the adequate information to the level of the subject's understanding, we get the subject's assent. This needs to be documented. How do we document this? We document this on an assent form. So let's say, if, for example, I'm doing a pediatric clinical trial. I will have a consent form which meets the ICH GCP's minimum requirements, which I showed you earlier, earlier on. Then I will develop an assent form. So let's say if it's a child, what kind of information will I put in there? Well, GCP doesn't give you guidance on this. 
this is left up to the IRBs to decide. So usually a child, a consent assent form from a, for a child is fairly simple. It can have little pictures on it explaining things. So very, very targeted at a level that the subject will understand. So this is very important is this word assent. So when we have individuals who are mentally incapable of giving consent, we need to think about asset. So we'll have a consent form that will be signed by the legally acceptable representative. And then we'll also have an asset form. And all of this process has to be documented in the medical records as to how consent is being taken. So assent is demonstrated in a child, for example, by the agreement to participate in the research. Now, it's, I've also sta stated over here, Ascent depends on the child's age and maturity. So the question is, when do I start taking ascent? Do I take ascent from a little baby? Do I take it from a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12? Where do we draw the line? Now, ICH GCP doesn't give us any guidance on this. However, if you remember from the first lecture, I told you there are a number of different guidelines. Well, ICH E6 is GCP. ICH E11 is conducting clinical trials in the periodic pediatric population. That will give us a little bit more guidelines. So that gives us some input into what age groups should we start taking assent from. So I'd ask you to refer to that for a lot more details, or we can answer it during question and answers. So the assent form should be written in a child's level of language and understanding, and just has basic information in there which is then documented. Now, for us to put a child to participate in a clinical trial, if the parent gives permission to participate, and if the child assents, then we put them in the research. Same would apply for a mentally incapacitated subject. We must get a consent, and where possible, we must have assent from that individual, and they will then go into the research. It gets a little bit more complex than that, but I just want to give you the essence of, of how we're going to do this. So what about emergency situations? Now, let's say, for example, we're doing trials in stroke patients, or let's say now with COVID happening, we're getting unconscious patients coming in. How do we do this? Well, when we say emergency situation, we mean a situation where consent is not possible. So this subject is unconscious. We cannot take consent, but we want to put them in a clinical trial. Well, then what we will do is we will try to get the consent from the legally acceptable representative. I have abbreviated that to LAR, legally acceptable representative. So we will get consent from them. What if we cannot find the legally acceptable representative and the subject may die? What happens then? That's where ICH actually says, you know, describe this process in your protocol. So there's some flexibility here. It says, you know, describe this because consenting in emergency is very complicated. We will always want to where we can try to save lives for where there's no treatment available. And what we'll do is if you have emergency situations and what you would do is describe in the protocol how consent will be taken if a legally acceptable representative cannot be found. Now, let's say, for example, we have an emergency situation, we get the legal accept representative, we get their consent. As soon as the subject comes around or is able to make a decision, we will get their consent to participate, to continue. Very, very important. Autonomy, respecting the rights of the subject. So having said that, Consent has to be documented. It's a documented process. Okay? The person obtaining consent. Now, GCP says that the investigator or the person obtaining consent must take, uh, a person obtaining consent should take consent. So who is allowed to take consent? Now, I see GCP is a little bit vague on that and just says investigator or delegated, person, individual delegated to. What the Declaration of Helsinki states is that it's usually a physician who takes informed consent. So my advice to you here is the consent form itself, that signature on the consent form has to be of a, of a physician. So the physician will sign it and date it. Now remember consent is a process. 
It's a process where a lot of study team members can get involved in helping or providing information to the subject, helping them understand the subject, understand the study. So for example, typically what happens initially, the investigator or doctor will have a discussion with the patient. Then the study nurse or the study coordinator will spend more time explaining this to them, answering any questions if there are any questions. Then the patient goes back to the doctor who will address any questions. And then this physician will make a decision that did they understand and enter and then sign and date and enter them into the study. So as a site, as an investigative site, what would be really good is if you have within your institution a process on how you take informed consent. Very, very important. So the signature and the consent form for a person who is literate, can read and write, you have two signatures, person obtaining consent and the subject. If the subject is illiterate, you'll have three signatures, the person obtaining consent, the impartial witness and the subject. If it's a minor, then, the, then on the consent form, you'll have the legally acceptable representative and the person obtaining consent, and you'll have an assent form. Now, this is what GCP is saying about consent and how consent is done. Okay. So that's a little bit of an overview, and I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. So I've, left, I've uh, stopped sharing now. I think uh, I should.